one, Mr. Will Harris joining me from Bluffton, Georgia. How you doing this morning? Doing good, Slam. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Yes, sir. Did you um start your day with a big old cup of coffee? I did. I did. In fact, it was a little bit bigger than that one right now. Well, <laughs> well I am uh, very excited to have you on. I think, uh, like a lot of people, maybe I'm, I found, I first listened to your first episode on Rogan. Um, I listened to, you know, got into what you were doing then. Uh, me and my wife have really been trying to find cattle and meat that we could purchase um, where we felt it was being done the right way. And I feel like you are the catalyst for that and what you're doing at White Oak Pastures. I'm really curious to hear the story and also get into some things y'all are doing now and also some complications that y'all have seen come into the industry. Um, you are fourth generation and you are, aren't you on the same land your great grandfather settled in? It is. My great grandfather came to this farm in 1866 and farmed it, followed by his son, my grandfather, followed by his son, my father, followed by me, and uh, currently being farmed or uh, help. Uh, I, I'm helping them, but they're helping me. I don't know. Uh, two daughters and their spouses. Mm -hmm. And between them, they have uh, five children that are my grandchildren. That's one, two, three, four, fifth, fifth generation on the farm. Sure. There we go. What was, um when your great-grandfather started the farm, what was it then? <clears throat> you know, most of what we know about that is anecdotal. There, there, were, no, there were no great records kept. But uh, it would have been a, a, a multi-species farm, and uh, and they, they were livestock producers primarily, and uh, they actually slaughtered animals on the farm in the late 1800s and brought the meat every day, six days a week, to Bluffton, the little town I'm sitting in now, two miles from where the farm was then. It, the farm still is it's expanded up mm -hmm. where, and uh, and sold it, peddled it off a mule-driven uh, uh, wagon, and, uh, and that's the way they made their living, and they were successful for that time and place and expanded the farm, and uh, my dad changed it post-World War II. That's what um, my next question was. What post-World War II, what kind of went on in the farming industry and um, maybe even like new technologies or new like inventions, I guess you could say that came in to, I think kind of harm the industry in the long term. but what were, how did that transition happen? Yeah. So post-World War II is when the, the evolution of agriculture really accelerated. Uh, it it uh, became a commodity uh, driven industry, uh, uh, very industrial uh, and, and my dad uh, was born in 1920. He was uh, 25 years old at the end of the World War II. He his he really uh, industrialized the farm. When his watch it became a monocultural cattle um, farm, and uh, he was and, and my dad was successful. He he made money every year and expanded the farm. Mm -hmm. And we, we certainly weren't rich people, but we had no debt and we had, had some assets <clears throat> and that's where he ran the farm all his career. And I came, I was born in 1954, uh, went to the university of Georgia in 1972, graduated in 1976. And all I ever wanted to do is be an industrial cattleman, just like my dad. Mm -hmm. I, I, I loved it. And I did, I made, uh, got a degree in animal science, came home and ran the farm very industrially. Uh, under my father's supervision at first and later on my own. <clears throat> and I ran it that way for 20 years. Very industrial. A lot of chemical fertilizers, a lot of pesticides, a lot of hormone implants, a lot of subtherapeutic antibiotics, a lot of ionosaurs, dot, dot, dot. A mm -hmm. lot of technology. In the mid-90s, I was enjoying it less and less and uh, made the decision to, to do something different without any real 
uh, vision of what something different looked like. So I, but I started just doing things the way I wanted to, which was a lot different. And I made less money, but I enjoyed it a lot more. And uh, uh, the timing was just so, so lucky, Sam. Uh, it, uh, it, <clears throat> if I'd done that day, it wouldn't have worked. If I'd done it 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have worked. But I hit the sweet spot when grass-fed beef was first becoming kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I actually sold Whole Foods markets and Publix the first pound of American grass-fed beef that they wow. marketed as American grass-fed beef. Purely lucky. I did not see that coming. And and and, and to be honest, <clears throat> we weren't doing very well. You know, the farm had gone from no debt, making money every year to uh, to, to not being profitable. And, what were uh, some of those early changes you made? Mostly giving up stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I gave up the drugs and the animals. I gave up chemical fertilizer. I gave up pesticides. Uh, I gave up confinement, feeding. Uh, mostly it was, uh, it was more what I gave up initially than what I started doing differently. Mm -hmm. And I liked it a lot better. I could see... Uh, I could see the potential for improvement for the animals and the land, but I, I just couldn't make much money doing it. And uh, uh, but, but as I said, the market shifted to my to, to my favor, and it's shifted back the other way since. So it's, it's <laughs> not all sweetness and light, but you know it it, uh, it gave us a breath of fresh air when I desperately needed a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Did you make those changes because you? You mentioned you weren't enjoying it as much. Was it because you you didn't feel the animals were living the way they should live? You know, you wanted a more humane way of doing it. Like, what triggered that for you to make that change? You know, I think animal welfare was the kind of the canary in the coal mine for me, but it was followed very quickly by the environmental side of it. You know, I, I, I simply fairly suddenly realized that what I had always thought was good animal welfare was not good animal welfare. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that raising cattle in a monoculture, as long as I kept them well fed, well watered, within a comfortable temperature range and free from predation, that was good animal welfare. And I thought that was good as it, good as it needed to be, but it wasn't. You know, the animals in that uh, confinement feedlot scenario uh, didn't have the opportunity to express instinctive behavior. And that's that's just not a good deal. That's what prison's all about. Hmm. Uh, and then very quickly, when I started changing my program on animal welfare, I realized that, that you know, we're, we're treating the land as badly as we are the animal. Mm -hmm. So again, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, dot, dot, dot. So I started changing that. And in both, both cases, land and the animals, the, the change was financially painful. It, mm -hmm. it uh, you know, we were doing what we were doing because it generated a profit from my operation and, and, and it consistently generated a profit. So when I quit, when I quit doing that, I had to be creative about finding ways to to monetize what I was doing and make money with it. With um, what were some of those in, like early identifiers of the challenges that would be in place when you did give up a lot of that stuff? Like, why did that slow down your production? Why does that, you know, make it more difficult to raise the play? Well, all all of those things that I was doing, the the the, the, the besides. You know, yeah. <laughs> pesticide, insecticide, herbicide, nematicide, side means kill. All of those things that I was doing were uh, were done to generate a profit. Ultimately, mm -hmm. it was a it was a production method that was focused on killing stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I was really good at it. I mean, my dad had been really good at it, and I'd gone to college to study it and come home and really focused on it. It was, you know, I didn't know who won the Super Bowl, but I knew what sides to use to kill <laughs> what I wanted to kill. And 
and I used them. And I, I, I literally spent my days looking for something to kill. You know, I would go to the pasture every morning and look for a plant or insect or uh, bug or worm or mold or mildew or, or what something that was uh, damaging my cattle or my grass. Mm -hmm. And I and I knew what to to go to the store and buy to spray on it to kill it. And and what I did not realize until later was that that whole system is just so bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all focused on ending a, the life of a species when things should be based on keeping the cycles going, keeping keeping things alive. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every there, there's a system out there. It's a cycle, and all of these creatures have a role in that cycle. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, view it in the in the linear manner of just production of one species, in my case, cattle, we lose we lose that view. So we start. Uh, uh, the, 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 we gravitate towards killing anything out there that's not doing what we want it to do. And that's not the way it works. You know, there are mm -hmm. cycles of nature, and they're important. Yeah. And when the cycles of nature are operating optimally, it spins off an abundance, and that abundance is the wealth. You know the you know all that coal and oil and natural gas on the ground. Mm -hmm that we're living on now is the abundance of the prehistoric era of the dinosaur. Yeah. And, you know, we have, uh, in, since World War II, probably before that, we really accelerated it since World War II, have ceased to focus on creating that abundance in mm -hmm. that way. When, um, I guess the term, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for most people that, could understand it. They say your farm is now a regenerative farm. That is how you raise your cattle, you know, everything on your farm in that way. How do you describe that to people? Yeah, that's hard. So, I mean, that's a great word, but it's today's word. You know, it's, I've, I've been doing this for 25 years and every time we come up with a word that describes what we're doing, <laughs> The big multinational food companies, uh, pesticide companies, technology companies take it away from us. And they're, they're about 30 seconds away from taking regenerative. They, you know, they took organic. They took natural. They took uh, <laughs> grass-fed. They took all, all of these terms that we come up with. Are so We think are so clever and, and marketable. Just get taken from us. So, you know... <clears throat> We can call it, uh, we can call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, but what we do is focus on the cycles of nature, the carbon mm -hmm. cycle, the the water cycle, the mineral cycle, the uh, microbial cycle, the, the grazing cycle. There's just infinite number of cycles going on out here in my pastures right now, 24-7, 52 weeks a year. And what we're about is finding ways to optimize, to help nature optimize those cycles and to harvest the abundance that's produced by that and processing it and marketing it. Mm -hmm. And that, and the, and it's, you know, the difficulty came from uh, figuring out the cycles of nature is not rocket science. I mean, I think that most any thinking adult, if they spent time in nature, would see that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Learning how to use it to produce raw material of food is also not rocket science. Get, making it, processing it to the point that it can be marketable and then marketing it, that's, that's real hard. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's quite difficult. With um, When you talk about your cattle, or the species you'll have on the farm. Like talk me through what they do on a daily basis, how they move around the pastures, how they graze and where they, you know, 
I think they moved to pasture to kind of pasture or how do y'all set that up for them to be able to live in that humane way? That's a good question. And then we'll talk about the home farm here. There's some other things like some solar grazing, grazing under solar projects that we do that's, that's very different. Okay. But yeah, we can talk about that if you want to. But the, the home farm here is about 3,200 acres. It's divided up into about 150 permanent paddocks. And we will talk about the cattle first because that's the, 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 the uh, well, Probably because I like cattle more than I like anything else. That, that's that's my you know, that's my default position. But uh, with the cattle are divided up into basically three herds. This changes a little bit, but basically three herds: a summer calving herd, a winter calving herd, and a finishing herd. And we move the animals from paddock to paddock every single day. No, uh, the 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 herds the herds are kept alone. The three herds on the hundred and fifty something paddocks. So we got mm -hmm. about fifty paddocks each, and we move them every day during the growing season. And we're blessed here in rural uh, and in very southern Georgia because the growing season for us is basically ten months a year. We we have very long and good weather, <laughs> good well hot but good wet but good. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's it's just, it's great for what I do. And, and let's say this, what I do here is not going to work in Nevada or Maine or Arizona. I mean, every ecosystem uh, has strengths and weaknesses, pluses and minuses, and you mm -hmm. got to make your operation fit your ecosystem. And in ecosystems, you don't have to go that far. I mean, they change quickly. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, we move the cattle uh, every day. It's a uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there, there's not it's not a cattle drive. They are it's like Pavlov's dog. They're conditioned to move <laughs> every day. So you when you open the gates, you better get out of the way because they gonna run over you. <laughs> we uh, uh, move them every day, uh, except during the not the dormant season when we feed hay, and uh, uh, and it's just a, 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 a beautiful system. It's just incredible, and, and what it's done is. It has moved the organic matter in my soil from a half a percent to 5%. Wow. 0.5 to 5. 5.0. 5. A 10x increase in organic matter. And that is one of the primary goals of this kind of farming, is to build the organic matter in the soil. Organic mm -hmm. matter is the life of the soil. And a cultivated soil a historically cultivated soil like mine was in, up to the mid nineties is a dead mineral medium. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not much different from the, a parking lot, a dirt parking lot. Yeah. It's like a living soil now. Now it's a living soil. That's exactly right. And, and we can talk a lot about organic matter. It, you know, a whoops of organic matter will absorb a one inch rain event. Mm -hmm. That's 27,000 gallons of water per acre. And if you got a five percent organic matter soil, which I do, it'll hold a five inch rain event, and we get five inch rain events. And not, not if it comes in an hour, but if it comes over. Yeah, we just had a lot of rain come through this past weekend. Yeah, yeah. So building the soil is is one of the primary goals uh, of this, and it's I feel so strongly about it because you know it's a. Uh, it is not cost effective to endeavor to raise your organic matter in soil if you're only going to have it for 10 years, mm -hmm. five years. It's just, it just takes too much time. But if it's so, if you're taking a generational approach, I'm doing this, you know, for my children and my grandchildren, then it's absolutely the thing to do, the, yeah. economic, the economic thing to do. What is the, What's the um, advantage or what does it do to the animals to allow them to live that way? Uh, good question. So the animals do require a little bit of adaptation, but nature takes care of that. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, you, you put the herd or the flock or the drove in the management system that you expect to operate in the long term mm -hmm. and 
and evolution cuts in. You know, they, they, those that are uh, conditioned to prosper in that will breed, get pregnant, give birth. Uh, those that don't do well need to be, they need to be culled from the herd. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we've had, we did had to do a lot of that. You know, our, our herd, I had bought uh, animals that were, had been bred for many generations to do well, eating corn out of trough in a feedlot. And that's a different kind of animal than one that can do well roaming and grazing. Mm -hmm. And it, it and I had to let the herd evolve. And that that that's financially painful too. You, yeah. you are, are, it's not an uh, easy transition, you know. I, I, I certainly don't want to trick anybody into believing it's an easy transition. It's a great transition. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not the right quick. transition. <laughs> it's the right transition. But it's not quick, it's not easy. It's expensive, um, and you've got to figure out how to afford to do it. What um, the meat that comes from your cattle, why is it, or what is it, I guess, why is it healthier or better for us to consume as humans? Now, that's a great question, and I'm going to say that I have found it's important to me to limit my commentary to the land, the animal, and the impact on the environment and the impact on the rural community. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I have opinions. I've studied, I've read a lot about it, and I've got opinions on health and nutrition and safety and all these things. But I'm not, and I'm, I'm not an expert in that. You know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, if I'm challenged, I, I have to roll over. You know, in terms of the land, the animals, the rural economy, you know, I, you know, I, I, I get nose to nose. <laughs> so I mean, I, I truly believe, and, and and culinary. You know, I don't, I don't like to have the culinary discussion. I, I, there are those that can do that so much better for me than I can do it for myself. Mm -hmm. But you know, I do believe that our meat is probably uh, healthier and safer. But I, I don't. That's you know, when, when I was first, I never visited many websites when I had my first website built in the early 2000s. You got a nice website now. Well, thank you. Thank you. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I paid for it, but I, my daughter and, and other, other experts uh, did it. But uh, when I had the first one made, uh, you know, I was young and foolish and I had them put everything I'd ever heard that was good about grass-fed beef in the website. And then I, I I got out a bit and heard people speak and realized how stupid a farmer sounds when we start talking about safety, food safety and <laughs> human health and all these other So I said, wait a minute. And I, I, I remember the day I told them, I said, I want you to go on that website and take out everything in there that's a, a claim or an attribute that's not about the land, the animals, the rural economy, mm -hmm. those kind of things. That that's that's what we're good at. Yeah. Um the impact industrial farming is having on the land and the animals. Um talk to me about how y'all have I think you've known it probably for a long time, but you've talked about some recent discoveries about um, some of the runoff from uh, pollution and chemicals and all the pesticides, all the sides you say, you know, what is that impact having on the land and, uh, you know, right in line with the impact it's having on animals of other species? I think it's terrible. And I think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the number of species that have been driven into extinction by the use of, pesticides and monocultural food production and all these other things that we do is just a, 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 an immense number of species. And, you know, there, some of them are not, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the right word would be, but not uh, uh, the species. It's, it's not like, you know, chimpanzees or dogs, but it's those, those creatures had a role in this ecosystem. Mm-hmm. There was something that they did, 
And when we drive them into extinction, whatever they did is going to have to either go undone or morph or something. So I, I, I really agonize when I hear of species of plants or animals or my, microbes that are becoming extinct because of something we've done through technology, the, the abuse, overuse of technology. Uh, there was another part of that question. Jeff. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's allowed? You know, what is, what is allowing these industries to continue to use it? And then like the long-term effects it's having on the land. Well, I think it's allowed because there's so incredibly much money involved that, uh, you know, that's, that's the way business is done mm -hmm. at this time. You know, and I've been, you know, uh, you know, I think I think a lot about uh, tobacco in the '60s. You know, to, the tobacco companies used to sponsor virtually every little sitcom that came on the TV, and smoking was uh, considered it cool. Yeah, it is cool. It's a rite of passage, and mm -hmm. a lot of people still smoke. I'm not being critical of that. I'm I'm talking about how the the, the messaging. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about here. And you know, the Marlboro, I was, I was raised watching the Marlboro Man thinking, wow. Geez, yeah, definitely. That's, that's good stuff there. And uh, ultimately, and it took a long time, it took some brave people to call out big tobacco on the way they were messaging and, and the way that the claims they were making and all these things. And ultimately, the, the, the changes were made. You know, in turn, the, the regulatory changes were, were made. So I don't think that's going to happen today. You know, I think that uh, our political system is so driven by money, mm -hmm. big money, big companies, that when uh, the uh, downsides of the way we farm are lifted up, I think it can be squashed. Yeah. There's just too much money involved. And I think that this is not going to happen. I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't think that, uh, There'll be any change in the way we produce food in this country brought to bear if it's dependent upon the government or land grant universities or the Cooperative Extension Service or anybody else. I think that if we do, we, uh, the pe we the people, that's, that's a nice word, do something about it, it's going to be we the people. It's going to be because consumers mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm just not going to support that anymore. Yeah, definitely. And I think we're light years from that happening, sadly. I yeah. think that the messaging of these big companies, uh, these multinational food companies and pesticide companies is so good. Yeah, it's all about you, money. You, you mentioned earlier about the, the freight, you know, uh, organic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, organic. I used to, I used to be certified organic here. I'm not anymore. But today, you can grow certified organic tomatoes that never touch the soil and never see sunlight. Dang, it was, it's cert, USDA certified organic. Now, you know, it took some, it took a lot of money to do that. Yeah, you know, I don't know who spent. How did that work? Yeah, how did that work? Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know who did it and how they got it done. I'm sorry they did it, but I got a lot of respect for what they can get done. Mm -hmm. What What were some of the things you've noticed? I think it was in uh, river runoff pollution or testing y'all have done in and around your farms and um, you know southern Georgia. Yeah, there's a pretty good video of that on, on our website. I think uh, it's a place where two. Uh, watersheds come together on my farm. Well, mm -hmm. One of the watersheds comes off my farm primarily, and the other watershed comes off a neighboring farm. And it's, uh, I see this several times a year, and then we videoed it one time, and it, it kind of went viral. Is that right, viral? So you, say that? you got it right. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, a lot of people looked at it. That's what I uh, <laughs> So, uh, but it's where the water coming off our farm. I think the watershed off our farm is a lot bigger than the other watershed. Mm -hmm. 
but the what where the water comes together in that video, it looks like it's a lot more water coming off the smaller watershed. And that's because the earth was half percent organic matter. So it didn't absorb it. It just washed off. Mm -hmm. There's water coming off ours too. It was a big hard rain and, and some of the water ran off. But much more of it soaked into the ground. And the water that did run off looked like tea. You know, it was, uh, uh, you know, the, the tannins from the plant roots discolored it, but you could still see light through it. Mm -hmm. The water coming off the uh, degraded watershed you know, looked like, uh, I don't know, strawberry syrup or something. I mean, it was, it very, you know, it was, it, it was muddy water, very, yeah. very muddy water. With uh, what do you think that's doing to the cattle or like your land from the runoff from those pesticides, even you know miles away? Oh yeah, they're, they're, I, that's a good question. I get it a lot. You know, uh, they they tell me that you can find uh, herbicides in the polar ice caps Dang. where there's never been any pesticides used. You know, it's, it's ubiquitous. You know, when, it, when, it, when we put it out there and the quantities that we put it out there in, it's everywhere. And, you know, I'm, I hate that. There's nothing I can do about it. I, I'm also a very strong property rights person. And, you know, I respect the right of my neighbors to farm their land like they want to. Mm -hmm. It's theirs. And they're, you know, some of them are smarter than me, more educated than me, and they made a different decision than me, and they get to do that. And that's what worries me, and and I do very little to prevent it because there's nothing I can do to prevent it. Mm -hmm. If it can make it to the polar ice caps, it can make it to white oak pastures. <laughs> with uh, with your cattle and um, I guess all the species you have on the farm, but I guess more specifically cattle. It used to be more corn, corn and soy fed. What kind of difference does it make to do grass fed and grass finished? <clears throat> well, it's certainly a number of things. Good, good question. Uh, first of all, the animals gain weight much more slowly. It takes me two years to grow a, from birth to, for, to grow a calf that weighs 1,100 pounds, 1,200 pounds. In the industrial model, in under two, in a, feeding corn and soy, in under two years, you can have them at 1,300, 1,400 pounds. Dang. So they, they, you know, they're, they're unnaturally obese creatures that would never occur in nature, but you sell by the pound. If you can make more pounds quicker, you can make more money if it's if it's at the same price. Yeah. Uh, from a health perspective, uh, the Wikipedia would tell you that the uh, life expectancy of a cow is twenty four years, and and I don't let my cows just live out there till they die, but if they did, I expect they'd be they'd be twenty four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the I don't know what the life expectancy of a feedlot animal would be, but it would be way short of twenty four years. I mean, like an obese human or something. Yeah, if those animals were, I, I you know, I, I've never done it, but I, but I'd kind of like to, I'd kind of like to, to see it done. You know, I'd, I'd like to know the results. I don't know if I want to see it done. But if those animals were left in that feedlot environment where they were gaining three or four or five pounds a day, which mm -hmm. they, they can do. And they just, you know, the, on the day they were supposed to be slaughtered, they didn't slaughter. They just left them in there, kept feeding them. I just wonder how long they last. <laughs> they'd be less than two. I don't believe they'd ever see four. Yeah. What's the um, normal time for an industrial farm to um, – slaughter a uh, cattle and then how what's the average time for you guys uh i would say is, is, that's, there's a lot of a lot of uh things that can vary the answer to that question but i would say that uh a uh, uh you know feedlot environment optimum feedlot environment something like 
17, 18 months of age would be when the industrial animal would slaughter. We, we think we're very, very lucky if we can do it at 24 months, maybe 30. Hmm. With, uh, what's the challenge, too, of having, you know, 10 species on your farm doing it in a way of regenerative farming where they're all moving around? Well, it's it's just really uh, to our advantage. That's why that's why I did it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, nature abhors a monoculture, and I had a monoculture of cattle, and then and I for, for a long time. You know, my dad from uh, I guess from uh, for fifty years from the end of World War Two to the mid nineties, fifty years was a monoculture of only cattle, maybe a little more than that. <clears throat> but it worked out okay because. Uh, I grew a monoculture of grass for them. Tufton 85 Bermuda grass is a nice. hybrid Bermuda grass. It's just incredible. It's just an incredible a simulator of chemical fertilizer. You can just grow it so, 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 such great grass. But when other species would show up in there, I would spray them. That's, you know, it's that side thing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for something to kill. I, I start to see weeds out there. Or well, the grasses, I'd go get a herbicide and spray it and keep my monoculture. You know, and I put a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, chemicals into the cattle. You know, hormone implants and such, and could you know, could just that's why and that's why I could make it grow them so fast. Yeah, but when I when I quit using when I when I went when I quit using herbicide, it was take that that route. I just told you how that works. When I quit using herbicide, uh, I started having a lot of stuff growing in my pasture that I didn't want. Cattle mm -hmm. preferred not to eat it. So that's when we brought in sheep and goats, and they nice. loved it. So, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> it's working with nature instead of against nature. It's imperfect. It's imperfect, uh, but it's... Uh, it's just so good for the, the, the cycles of nature. Just keeping yeah, everything going. Proper. It's the real cycles of the environment and the land um, that had been around for thousands and thousands of years. With um, being made in America, raised, slaughtered, made in America, that seems to have some controversy around it. Um where it's not all made in America, even though we're getting stamps that say made in America. Um, at your farm, do you put made in America on your products? And um, does it bother you much when you see things that you know weren't made in America say they were made in America? We, we do we do say it's made in America, made in Georgia, actually. But uh, uh, and, and what, you what you touched on here is, is what happened to the profitability in our business. Uh, things were going well for us. And when I say us, I mean white and passionate. I also mean there were other farms around the country, you know, going in our direction, developing in our direction. Yes, sir. And at that point, uh, for, for reasons that I could speculate, uh, they changed the definition of uh, product of the USA. And it, it, it became, uh, if, if value, instead of uh, animals being born, raised, and processed here, if they were, if they had value added in the USA, then it was a product of the USA. And I believe that was done very intentionally. I can't prove that, but I'm not, it just makes yeah. sense. It does make but sense. It, it it uh, what that did was that opened the door for the importation of foreign grass fed beef to come in and be marketed as product of the USA le legally, and that really uh, took the wind out of the sails of the grass fed beef production effort in this country. We have been able to stay in business because we were pretty well established by 2005 or six, when that rule change was done. I believe it was done in 2005, but it happened in 2006. We were we, we had our legs under us and we were able to stay in business. We made less money, but it was okay. But I had friends and, and, and just people I thought a lot of that uh, it has not gone well for them. 
Mm-hmm. And it's, I think it's, I think it's uh, an abuse of power. Yeah. With, um, with the label zero waste, can you give me an example of how that works on the farm? I, I can give you an example of how it works here. Yes, sir. Uh, and and, and there's there no label zero waste. There's mm-hmm. just a claim, and we, we claim it. And uh, and we claim it because of well, no, a number of things, but the biggest one is uh, we slaughter our animals here on the farm. I've got a USDA-inspected red meat slaughter plant and a USDA-inspected poultry slaughter plant side by side. And uh, five days a week, we operate them five days a week, except for holidays, we'll generate about nine tons of what USDA calls packing plant waste. That would be feathers, guts, gut fill, mm-hmm. feet, you know, just, just whatever, the bones that aren't marketable for soup, whatever, whatever is just, they're not fit for human mm-hmm. consumption. Yep. And uh, we uh, compost that nine tons of, of material a day. And uh, got a, we got about a, a 30-something acre field that we dedicate to uh, to that. Uh, and we, uh, we turn, turn, turn it every day. We mix. So uh, composting is a nitrogenous material and a carbon material put together to chemically and uh, biologically transform yep. and uh, we take uh, our packing plant waste guts and whatnot nine tons a day and the carbon that we bring in which would be uh, tree chip, chip trees that uh, peanut shells or whatever people give us mm-hmm. we mix it they maintain the temperature at a certain level stir it and then we let it sit for a year. <clears throat> we let it sit for a year because I'm told that if it's if the compost sits a year, it moves from being more uh, bacterial to more uh, fungal, and it's mm-hmm. better. And then we spread that on our farm, and it's I tell you, it's like magic. It is some, <laughs> it's some good stuff. I it's bet just, it makes the grass just grow. Yeah, it's like a. Do you call it fertilizer? Like, what do you call it when you put it on there? We call it compost. I compost, think. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. My mom, my wife, uh, my mom, my wife has compost in our freezer. <laughs> 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 with uh, with what you produce at the farm, um, do you have a favorite cut of beef or your go to, um, you know, meal from the cattle and and what you raise? You know, I like it all. I mean, I, I gotta say, I like beef more. Than I like pork or lamb or chicken because I was raised, raised primarily on beef, but mm-hmm. I, I live it all. Just it depends on how you fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, there are cuts that you grill, there are cuts that you braise, there are cuts that you grind and, and it's, it's all good. And I, and you know, one of the problems I think is the, we don't eat nose to tail in this country. And I think we ought to, yeah. you know, I, I, I very seldom, Eat steak. I mean, we we we. I have a restaurant that we cook three meals a day, seven days a week, and it's our all our products. And when I go there, I sell them all steak. It's not, it's not the steak's not good. It's just, I mean, it's great. But everybody wants steak, and I'm mm-hmm. just as happy with something else. So I let them have it. <laughs> with uh, I do. Uh, what are what are the ten species, or what are the species you do have on the farm? We have uh, cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, and five poultry species. And we're actually taking a, a closer look at our poultry. That's not a, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that long term. Mm-hmm. I'm doing some uh, uh, renovation in my poultry processing plant. And we're kind of hiatus on poultry other than my laying chickens. I still got them. But we, I just got, we got, we got to figure that out. Yeah. What's uh with your chickens and so you let them just like graze or roam like a pasture or field? They uh we, we no, yes, but we do feed them. We feed them a non-GMO feed, but they are loose in the pasture. Uh, they used to be 
uh, completely loose in the pasture. I mean, they I, I used to say they could walk to the line if they wanted to. <laughs> Uh, and, and and it was not a problem as far as them getting away because they're gonna stay pretty close to that food and water. Mm-hmm. And we moved it, we moved it every day so it was on fresh ground every week or whatever it needed to be moved. We had a, a, a horrible incident with uh, bald eagles. Mm. Uh, they just inundated us, and uh, we had to change that up a little bit. And I had guardian dogs. That did uh, Great Pyrenees and Akbosh and other breeds that did a great job protecting my chickens from nighttime predation. Yeah. But I, in the daytime, they'd go to the woods. They were nocturnal too. They'd go to the woods and go to sleep. Mm-hmm. So the eagles, which were operating in the daytime, would just converge. And uh, we we had to uh, put a wire around the outside of the perimeter where we had the chickens or sheep or, or uh, ducks or whatever, not to keep the chickens in, but keep the dogs in so they'd yep. stay there and protect them. Gotcha. Yeah, we've had uh, had some good friends. They lost almost all their animals to some wild dogs recently. Yeah. Yeah, well, those, I tell you what, they, they need to get them some Pyrenees or Akbash, Akayushi. So they, they, the wild dogs won't be a problem. <laughs> All right. Um, talk to me about your team. I know uh, you got your three daughters helping you. Like, what type of team does it take to to uh, do what y'all do there at White Oak Pastures? Yeah, that's been very interesting. So we, uh, it's two two dollars, by the way, two dollars and two in laws. But uh, All right. I have three dollars, but two are work here. So, uh, you know, when I when I farmed industrially up in the mid nineties, I have three or four employees, full time employees, and that was all I had. And I was the only decision maker on the farm, and it was fine. It was absolutely fine. And we started moving, changing things, adding things, and today we've got one hundred and seventy something employees. And for a long time, I was still the only decision maker here, or maybe one of them. And that just, boy, I, I, that, that that was not working. Mm-hmm. So we decided to put some structure into it. And today we've got uh, uh, seven directors. I'm one of them. And my two daughters, my two uh, uh, in-laws, and two non-family members. And we supervise about 25 managers. We supervise about 150 something other employees. And everybody's got uh, businesses that they're in charge of. And they run them pretty autonomously. We only got one operating statement, the one bottom line. And, you know, it's, it's okay if, if my business loses a little money to help your business make more money. That's okay. But it's uh, it's 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 really it's really a lot of fun, and I think it's really uh, has a lot of permanence. I think it'll I think it'll last. Yeah. What um, it could be personal and professional too. Like, what brings you the most joy doing what you do? Oh, uh, seeing it all work. You know, seeing the uh, <clears throat> the cycles of nature get better and better. And yield and abundance mm-hmm. that we can you know, provide to people that want it. It's fun. Yeah, you um, you know, I know there's other farms out there that you know they're looking to do what you do, or um, maybe you're in the same, you know, I don't want to say same class, but I feel like what you're doing is unique and special, and I just wish it was done more. Um, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I love it, and uh. I know it's been your family's work for 150, almost close to 150 years. And uh, I'm excited for people to learn more about it. I hope, like you said, like we, the people got to make the choice eventually um, to push for more farming and more raising and more environmental concerns. Um, So our farms, our animals, our environment will live and last longer um but i've really enjoyed having you on um i know it's a lot hopefully very educational for people um but hopefully people get a lot out of it 
and now it can change their perspective or just wake them up a little bit more um, to kind of what's going on and maybe push them in a direction to, I think, live healthier, <laughs> but also create our environment and our animals live healthier. Well, I really appreciate being on, and I want to say that I, I don't want to give people the impression that I think that White Oak Pastures is the only farm in the country that's doing it right. Mm -hmm. We are not. There are a number of good farms. There are not enough. Yeah. There are a number of good farms all over the country. And while I appreciate all the business consumers give us, this is not my cry to do business with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my plea to do business with somebody that's doing it right. Yeah. And you said it right. Like it's it's just not enough, but there's plenty of good farms. There's I urge you to find somebody that you who's talking an amount of that you like as near to your home as you can and support. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Will Harris, thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. I hope you and the family have a wonderful Christmas. It's just a few days away. Uh, but thank you for joining me. Thank you, Sam. Today, uh, today is my uh, what, 69th birthday. It is? It is. It Look is. at that. It's the uh, 22nd of December? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so thank you for having me on your show today. It's been very special. Yes, sir. Thank you, and happy birthday. Thank you. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas. All right. Great job.